and we're going to come up with a unique solution. Even though they may not be uh, what we currently do right now, they know that Blueprint will stay with them. We get them the solutions they need and we'll make sure everything runs well before we even walk away. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode. I'm very excited. We're going to be talking about how one OEM thinks inside the box, not outside. It's going to be a pretty fun conversation and to walk with us through it, we have Chung Chi Tai, who is the Vice President of Engineering at Blueprint Automation. So welcome, Chung Chi. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? All right. Oh, I'm excited. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's a beautiful day. Well, it's kind of, it's a little overcast, but it's Friday. So we're over, we won't worry about the weather, you know? That's right. <laughs> Well, you know, Chung chi we do have a lot of listeners out here for Eco Ask Why, and not all of them are familiar with OEMs. So could you just walk, get us started by explaining what an OEM actually is? So OEM is three letter words, O-E-M, Original Equipment Manufacturers. So what Blueprint does, we do is uh, we provide a packaging solution. So in basically we have a packaging machine um, we are more than just providing a machine that packs um, a product into a case. We are really a solution. So we are an integrator as well. Um, our customers, they come to us and they, they say, hey, I have this product, for example. And then I want them in a case in certain format. And we figure out how to make that happen. Sometimes we have to flip a product. Sometimes we have to split up uh, a group of products. Sometimes we have to merge a group of products and just manipulate them and get them into the case. And on top of that, we have to get a finished case, a finished product from one spot to another spot somewhere else. So we are, in addition to just selling a, patching, a piece of packaging equipment, we are really providing a solution to the customer. And we are very flexible and we are proud of that. That's, that sounds awesome. I mean, and how about, you know, has things have changing throughout industry in general. I'm sure OEMs are seeing that too. What are you seeing as some of the most prevalent changes that OEMs are facing to serve clients in the future years? So what we are seeing the most, that, that will impact us the most right now is the, um, the ease of implementation of the automation uh, solution. You know, 20 years ago, what we see is customer, they'll buy a machine and then they'll tweak it to run perfect. Mm -hmm. um, but they can spend two weeks tweaking it and they only run one product. Nowadays, they probably, they change to try to run two, three products a day. And the time that was afforded to tweak the machine to run perfect is no longer there. What they want is, you know, they want to push a button do um, what we say is a changeover because there are, there are parts of the equipment that has to touch the product. So sometimes that has to be removed and a different format has to be put in. And the time allowed before is no longer there. Everybody wants a, uh, a quick solution. I blame it on Staples when they came up with that easy button. Right, right, right. So now everybody is, is expecting them. So that's one thing we're seeing. And then the second part is the skill set of people, you know, the mechanics, the engineers that they, they can afford back then. A lot of companies no longer employ those people. Um, and then on top of that, the skill set of the operators is not the same. Um, a lot of times in the labor market is t still very tight. And, you know, to get they don't really know machines anymore. Um, the people that can tweak to understand the machines are just not there. So they want a machine that can handle itself. Um, that being said, the machine also needs to be smart enough. So when a machine stops for whatever reason, you cannot ask the operator to fix all the other issues somewhere else. You know, if there's a jam, I need to be able to clear the jam right in front of me 
and then hit reset and then start the machine back up. I should not have to go clear the products that are jam up somewhere else. It should not jam up somewhere else. When there's a fault and there's a recovery or if there's a stoppage, there's a recovery. Uh, it needs to be really, really easy. So, I mean, so you mentioned a couple of things, the ease of implementation being, sounds like that's the most prevalent for you trying to, to overcome, but also you touched on something that we've touched on several times throughout the, the, the show is the workforce attrition, the, the skilled labor, there's a gap there. So it sounds like that's impacting you as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, we have spent some time uh, looking at uh, the design, the interface of the machine. So if you look at uh, how a, a, a operator would interact with the machine really is through the HMI, which we buy from you guys, Rothwell. Um, we use the Panel, Panel V Plus 7. Um, that really is the only interface, uh, only information exchange between the operator and the machine. So when the machine say, hey, I got a problem, all that information needs to be displayed. Um, if the operator wants the machine to do something, is also through that exact same interface. Right. Um, the, the struggle that we have um, nowadays, um, I'm sure the guys at Eagle hear me talk about this all the time, is the training that it takes to tell the operator how to interface with that screen. So imagine I'm the operator at a factory and I buy the machines from five different manufacturers. And everybody has their screen layout different and design different. To be flexible, now I gotta learn every single machine, figure out how they are operating or how to get to certain screens. For example, um, you know, there are two major phone manufacturers in the market, in the US market anyway. So you have the iOS, you have the Android. So on the iOS, whether I pick a iPhone 5, 7, 8, 12, 13, you know exactly how to get to the screen that you need. You know, if you look at this button, it means certain things. It's exactly the same. Same with Android. Um, I'm not an Android guy. I can't really speak too much to it, but I imagine it's the same whether it's manufactured by, who makes them anymore? Uh, Samsung or Motorola or whoever, um, the, the screen is the same. But imagine you are the operator and I have to do, deal with these five machines. They are all designed different. The interface with them is all different. So you want to get to a, say, a system setting screen. How do I get there? You know, you have to look through, the buttons don't look the same. So that's a challenge. So my really, I've been pushing here and we're not certainly not there yet is for our machines to mimic what is on a phone. So we need the HMI to behave like the phone to behave. I mean, ideally I put an iOS on it that way, you know, they'll look exactly the same because all the operators that we get, um, they know their phones, they know their mobile devices. I don't have to train them. Yeah. I don't have to say, hey, this button means a system preference. I don't need that. They all know that already. Imagine that the, the, the training that is now compressed to so little. Right. I mean, that, that skills gap could really be closed pretty quickly then, I imagine, right? Yeah, exactly. We'd have to worry. We'd have to put some, uh, some modifications on those interfaces, though. We don't want Snapchat on our machines, you know? <laughs> hey, that's not a bad thing. You know, like, uh, imagine the machine is down for whatever reason, and then you just flip the HMI over, you look at that, and then you can talk to people like us, and then say, hey, you yep. see what I'm seeing right now? You know, right? can the HMI come with a camera? And can the HMI be mobile that the guys just take it off and then move to the machine and then turn their FaceTime on and then talk to us and say, hey, you see what I'm seeing? Right. Imagine that. And right now the HMI is just static. It doesn't move. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, technology is evolving so fast. So I, I, I can't imagine, but there's a, a room full of engineers across the world working on these types of solutions, you know? Yeah. This is great. So how about outside of the machine interface COVID because COVID's impact manufacturers and OEMs greatly. How is that? How are you guys reeling with that or dealing with it moving forward to support your customers? Yeah, we, when COVID first hit, uh, you know, we went to a sort of panic mode like everybody else because we don't really know where things are going. So um, our customers push a panic button first 
And then, I mean, of course, we kind of reacted to it because you know, ultimately you want to provide what your customer needs. So things kind of slow down maybe for a week or two for us. Um, and then when things started back up, what we realized is all our customers found out that, hey, when their people are not available to work, or when the, then they cannot put people close to a close proximity because you know they're six feet apart, right? So when they have all the air operators that you know stand around packing uh, the product into a case, it's no longer doable because people can get infected. Um, and people get sick, they don't show up for work. And people got panicked, they don't show up for work. Um, what they realize is the solution is for automation. They, now they need more machines. So, and that's what we're seeing, um, you know, with a machine, I no longer need five operators standing together trying to put product into a case. Um, so that's what we are providing as, you know, we are considered essential um, uh, workforce or essential workers just because the, the technology, the machines that we provide to our customers. Unfortunately, it's just not fast enough. Right, right. But how how yeah. about the impact for you for support and things like that? Have you had to look at remote connectivity or technologies like that to, to be able to support with COVID now? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, we have some plans, um, especially like in, uh, customers in Canada or even in South America nowadays, they won't let us in um, or it's very difficult to get in. Um, some cases they say, yeah, you can come in, but when you fly, when you cross a border, you have to quarantine for five days. Five days in a hotel before you can come into, I mean, you can't afford that. Yeah. So um, we, our machine is typically, and this is even before COVID, now it becomes more uh, relevant that we have an E1 connection. So when a customer calls and they say, hey, uh, I have this problem, you know, I can't, I don't know what's wrong and we can dial in to the, to the machine and we can look at it remotely. We make changes remotely. Uh, we utilize something like this. Uh, we utilize things like a team viewer, um, you know, cameras, do that as much as we can. We even start uh, looking into something like a uh, smart glass that the customer can walk around and show us what is going on. Now that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 We just need to map that to a, a, a alternate, uh, what is it, alternate reality? You can kind of map it. Yeah. Well, if you yeah. if augmented you, reality, yeah. augmented reality, if you can map the augmented reality and then you can really, you know, walk them right through the problem. Yeah. Very cool. You know, we're familiar with the Ewan solutions too. So it sounds like you're using that, like your talk to M to get to the machine itself and then be able to understand what's going on. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Our E1 is really a standard, is a standard for us nowadays. So every machine from Blueprint, they get an E1 in there. The biggest struggle that we have is some of the bigger customers, um, I guess from the IT side, they're just not comfortable with a device that can talk to outside the outside world. Um, right. You need to figure a way to overcome that. Cybersecurity, it's, it's, it's on top of everybody's, it's top of mind, you know? So, yeah. You know, but it's it, it can be done safely. And I think that IT, OT, the more mm -hmm. those, those types of groups can get together, we'll, they'll overcome that. Yeah. Now we were also when we were brainstorming, you brought up an idea that I wanted to definitely share with the listeners out there because it's one I haven't heard of people talk about. You were talking about, you know, I want to be able to to have remote power transmission, you know. So I'm just curious if you want to ex expand on that for our listeners on how that would impact you and, and help, you know, some of the things that you're working on. So I have a machine right now on the floor. Um, is the customer wants it very very quick? Uh, I need to ship it to Wisconsin. They are planning for a one day install. And I talked to our assembly, assembly sorry. That was one day you said? They want it one day, they, they bring it in, they put it down, they want to reconnect everything in one day. Wow. That's my expression too. Your expression is like, okay. <laughs> so it, to, to do that, the machine has to be broken down into one, two, three sections. And every section has inputs and outputs and pneumatics. And all those needs to be disconnected. And they need to be connected back. Um, every sensor, you have three or four wires. Mm -hmm. 
output two wires at least. Um, you get it's not fast thing to do. It's not gonna be one day. And even if you connect everything back, you still gotta check, make sure everything is connected to the right spot. So imagine that for a whole machine. Um, typically when the machines that, that we, we build with machines, all, you know, besides bringing the, the major free phase into the inner connection within the machine is a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, and then it's a lot of work to make sure they are connected correctly. Usually our technicians will wire up everything. They check as far as they can check. And then now I got to put a control engineer on it. It take about two to three days to troubleshoot all the potential wiring issues. And this is not even before I was actually move anything on the machine just to make sure all the wirings are done correctly. And it has to be repeated another time when the machines get torn down and reinstalled at the customer site. So the best, thing I can, I can think of is not having this problem. So, Eco, listen, I need a solution. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. It, it is a lot of, of connection points. I mean, do you, do you have on average the, the number of points that you're typically connecting with the machine you know, to get it up and installed? Is that a couple thousand connection points that you're, you're making up? So, um, if I, Sometimes our projects consist of multiple multiple lines. Yeah, you can get up to that point. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of times they get shipped overseas too. So imagine someone on the other side of the world, multiple time zones away, talking to you, trying to figure out. You know, actually, we are fighting one right now in uh, uh, with another customer with a safety PLC. We've been fighting this for the last two weeks. Um, you know, it, it's we are down to five devices. And we think it's going to take all week next week to figure out which one it is. Wow. Lot yeah. Of, a lot of troubleshooting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you mentioned too, I, I, in our pre-work, getting the end users familiar with the equipment. And you, I think you made a great uh, analogy. You said, do you ever buy a car and look at the, the user manual before you start driving? I said, of course not. You know? So, I mean, that, that, that really impacted me when we we're talking about. So, you know, how is that, how are you addressing that type of mindset with your end users? Yeah, so I, I have people that come to tell me that, you know, we need to get people properly trained. Okay, um, I mentioned the skill set of, of the operator nowadays, um, and they're not necessarily mechanically inclined. Uh, I, I've explained to people uh, in the past that you know, one reason I, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I'll tell you that I've never drawn anything on a piece of paper and I cannot even draw a straight line straight. My lines is horrible. Crooked. Okay. Yeah, it's crooked and my writing is horrible. It, it's, it's just bad. Um, it's so bad that when I was growing up, my dad says, Can you write any better than that? It's like, ah. Oh. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but the technology of 3D allow people like me to be able to design, even though I can't draw a straight line because of computer, because of the 3D graphics, you know, people that cannot think in 3D now they can actually draw something up because the technology allow them to do exactly that. So basically what happens is, you know, when you, when you used to require a specific pool of people that can do mechanical design, now we just open up that pool to allow more people that may not exactly can draw a straight line to bring in their creative uh, mind. Um, same thing with machines. It used to be, you know, we need skill set people that requires high wages. But if I can bring my machine to a point where I can bring anyone in, and actually that's true in a lot of our customers, um, they just can't find the people where they are located. So. They hire attempts, they bring whatever they bring in. And these people, the operators, they really do not know how to operate a machine. And to say, to tell the customers that, you know, you, you need training, you need training. Okay, that's one way to address it. But imagine I can have a machine that does not require training. A machine that works like a phone. Anyone can get on it, they know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. Imagine the machine that can walk or operate through, you know, the self-guiding, tell them what they need to do to achieve what they need to do. And 
what we've done at Blueprint so far, and you know, just a very, very early on uh, infant stage of, um, we put some self-guiding training videos. Um, we cannot put it on the HMI itself because it takes up too much memory. Um, what we do actually is we, we have a video, we put it on our YouTube channel, a Blueprint YouTube channel. And you, you can go up to it, um, you can see that, you know, if my uh, VFD 525 just went down, I have to replace it. What are the steps that is required to replace that VFD? So you go up to our HMI and then there's a couple of how-to videos. Uh, it's just in a 2D barcode, a QR code. So you take your phone and go up there and you scan it and you take it to our YouTube channel. And here's the guy walk you through step-by-step. Step. Now that is cool. Now, did you guys make those videos yourself in-house? Yeah, yeah. The biggest struggle that we have is actually to get the engineers in front of the camera. They Usually they are pretty uh, shy about right. getting in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that definitely, you know, I, I I've been there myself. You know, I still say I have a face for for radio, but not not this format. But you know, we'll, we'll go with it. You know, Chung Shi. I am curious. Those videos are they open like to anyone, or do you have to have special codes to get to some of these training videos? You need a QR code to get there. Uh, yeah. It's a private channel, so it's not there for everybody. Gotcha. But that's a yeah. unique, that's a unique way to address it because we're seeing more and more people gravitating to that video component for training. So hats off to you guys. Yeah. I'm just copying what a lot of people are like the self-help on YouTube. So it's not a new idea, but well, like how, I said, infant stage. How long have you been doing? Have you, have you just started it? Uh, I've been doing that for, I would say about two years now. So we're just collecting the video, um, the how to for like the drives or certain devices that can be on, on every machine. But there are some others that are very, very machines or machine type specific. Um, so we got to re-record that every time. I was wondering, were there any common theme type videos that could be replicated across, you know, multiple users? So you don't have to make those, those videos, you know, those one-off videos every time. Yeah. The, the devices, you know, how do we replace the device? Those are just, they are the same for uh, different machine types. Gotcha. Well, that, that, yeah. that, it sounds like you guys are all over top of innovation there. I mean, so outside of the, the shyness of the engineers getting on, on board, any, any tips out there for OEMs that want to make videos? Do you do, guys do any scripting or just how does that work? You mean as far as making the videos? Yeah, just is there is like a, a, a script that they're reading through? Just what, what's the... Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, we just wing it. I'll wing it. Okay. <laughs> Off the fly. I love it. I love That's it. That's right. Okay. Just That's exactly good. what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're doing a phenomenal job. So I guess you guys have like a marketing group or something like that that helps you finalize and package it and put it all together for your end users? Yeah, we got people who can do that. That's very cool. That's very cool. So one thing I love to ask guests, and, and we haven't had a, an OEM to talk about this, Chang Chi, is our common myths and, and give people a chance to debunk them about their, their space that they're working in. So is there anything from an OEM standpoint that you think people have a certain perception, but that's just not true? Yeah, so we do have certain OEMs. Um, what they do is they sell the same cookie cutter. Um, not to name names, but you know some people make a... A, a checkware, for example, they have the same checkware. Um, they will change the certain different parameters um, just to they would like different models. And Blueprint is different as an OEM in a way that we're not selling a machine or a particular machine. Um, I would say, like, if you look at the projects that we have throughout the years, um, even we're selling to the same, supposedly the same project to the same customer at the same location is different. Um, putting a machine over at this location versus another location, and there happens to be a post right in between, or there's a wall somewhere else. What that requires to do is to provide a different solution. The packaging machine itself is only one piece of the puzzle. What we, what we bring to the table you know, we basically, we approach a customer and say, hey, your product is coming from, from this one location and this is how it's coming in. It needs to get to a packer, a packaging machine and where they need to go. Anywhere in between, all the equipment that's required can change. 
and we are flexible in that way. Uh, whatever you need, we are very accommodating to the customers. Right, right. Yeah. So, so we, are, we are not just selling a cookie cutter. We're definitely not. We are selling a solution. That flexibility. And, and a lot of times that's what I had thought of in the past myself was just the cookie cutters, but it's not. Just by hearing you go through it, there's a lot of, of oh, flexibility yeah. and, and changes and, and, and modification. It sounds like it's, a, it's an exciting field to be in. Oh yeah, and I want to mention another thing. On top of that, um, sometimes we don't know how to do it for certain things, and we come up with a solution. It will be a one-up solution. Um, you know, maybe a, a that drives the innovation um, from our side, and we will do that for our customers. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like you have a passion for this. You look. You, you, you love what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. It's a fun thing I do. That's cool. I, I, my, my boss always says, you got to enjoy what you do. Otherwise, what's the point? That's right. What's the point? <laughs> so, so Chung Chi, this has been a lot of fun. We always end Eco Ask Why with the why. And that's where we're talking about the passion and really help our, our listeners understand you know, what's important at, at the core of the message. And this has been a fun OEM thinking inside the box. So for the, the OEMs out there that are listening, how, you know, why should they be evaluating how they serve their clients and be raising the bar to be the leader in their industries. So depending on how uh, we interact with our customers, um, there is a type that says, hey, I want a quick cutter, I want exactly the same thing. And then when a customers need a, um, extra steps, they want something more than just a cookie cutter. Um, they know they cannot go to uh, a, a vendor A or a vendor B. Um, they know that Blueprint is going to put in all the effort. It's going to listen to them. And we're going to come up with a unique solution. Even though they may not be uh, what we currently do right now, they know that Blueprint will stick with them. We get them the solutions they need. And we'll make sure everything runs well before we even walk away. Actually, we have machines that have been running out there for 20 some years. Um, I visited those customers. And they continue to buy from Blueprint. And I walk in there, I look at those machines, like, man, they should be in a museum. And yet they are still packing bags for those customers. Right. And right. that's what's unique about Blueprint. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank Chung Chi. This has been so much fun unpacking the, the OEM topic. You know, best wishes to you and Blueprint. And just thank you for what you've worked with Eco over the years. And we just look forward to continue to uh, supporting each other in the future. Thank you guys too. I mean, we, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we do today without a support from Eco and uh, you guys have been, uh, have been an excellent vendors for us. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. I'll pass that on to, I know you got your, your buddy, Rich, he's out there listening. So we'll, we'll make sure he feels good for about it. Yeah. And thank you, Gina. <laughs> there you go. Gina as well. And Gina actually connected us. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gina. So uh, thank you, Chung Chi. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. -S 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 -S